It's 6 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for, for being here this evening, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and the flag is right over there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's move on to item 1A, which is a reading of the school board meeting norms on electronic page two, uh, Josh. School board meeting norms are be prepared, be on time, value and respect each other, exercise thoughtful deliberation and conversation, be professional at the board table and when visiting with the general public, speak up when the norms are not being followed, and advocate on behalf of students and keep the community in mind. Thank you. Let's move on to item two, which is approval of the agenda. I have one addition to the agenda. If we could put that at 7N as in Nancy. It's a, a construction management at risk delivery method for construction of a new Valley Middle School centralized kitchen and security. Uh, Dr. Brenner, do you have any other additions or corrections? I do not, no. Okay. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the agenda as, as my recommended uh, amendment. Moved by Jeff, do we have a second? Second. Second by Monty. Any further clarifying questions, comments? Seeing none, assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries, thank you. Let's move on to uh, item three, which is celebrating success. We have the classified and certified employees of the fourth quarter. Uh, it's on electronic page three. And if, why don't we start with, with uh, uh, Dr. Harrison, why don't we start with you? Okay. We good? All right. Good evening. Welcome, board members. Um, as I said, my name is Chris Harrison. I'm the principal at Red River High School. It's my pleasure to be here tonight with our um, facilities manager, Mike Soley. And before I get into a, talking a little bit about Mike, I want to tell start with a quick story. So this is my 12th year at Red River High School, and it was my first summer at Red River. It was my first day. I moved into my office, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around at everything, and I look up and all of a sudden this blur goes by my window. And I'm like, that was a guy on a bike. And it's the end of June now. Keep in mind, no kids are around. It's the end of June. And I go out to Becky Schmidt, my secretary at the time. I go, Becky, who is that that just flew by on the bike? She goes, oh, that's Mike Soley. He uses that in the summer so he can get around the building a lot quicker and get more done. And I'm like, oh, all right, good to know. So since that time, Mike really hasn't slowed down. He still flies through the building. Mike is in his 28th year at Red River High School, 33rd year in the uh, Grand Forks School District. As a facilities manager, he is responsible for the overall maintenance and functioning of our school. Mike knows every inch of Red River and how everything works down, how everything works down to the tiniest detail. So typical day for Mike might be fixing a faucet, cleaning something, and then he shimmies down the ladder into the basement and works on a boiler, comes up, dust all over, fixing things. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, there's a air return on the roof unit that went out in the middle of the winter. And a half hour later, Mike comes walking down and he's got snow up to here as he's climbing across the roof, um, trying to get the building up and running and keeping things cool and warm and everything for our building. But he knows everything about our building. I've been reminded many times by our B&G directors over the years that they've come through Grand Forks School District. And they told me how lucky we are to have Mike at our building because he can take care of so many things where maybe another building might have to rely on work orders and having somebody come over and at Red River Mike is able to take care of it his uh, mechanical abilities his problem-solving abilities are just truly superior his abundant and vast knowledge regarding the functions of our school and all its systems are beyond measure Mike is the first one in our building every day, ensuring that it is ready for teachers to teach and students to learn. Mike makes sure the parking lots, the sidewalks, the entrances to the school 
are all ready and safe for everyone throughout every season of the year. Snow removal is completed before school gets going in the morning so parents can get in and teachers can get in um, and it's safe. Our gymnasiums and theaters are always ready and ready for all the functions that take place at Red River. Our, the garbages and the parking lots and at our school entrance, I mean, there's not a thing that Mike um, overlooks. He'll be out in the middle of the winter picking up garbage. It's, it's um, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, Mike's out there taking care of it. Just, he takes a ton of pride in Red River High School. And any of you have been in, a, been in at Red River, you'll notice how clean our building is, our parking lots, our entryways. I mean, Mike and his staff do a great job. Uh, the commons is always thoroughly clean every day. Our bathrooms are thoroughly cleaned every day. The hallways, the offices. Now, granted, Mike doesn't do all that, but he oversees a large staff and passes that message on in the pride that goes on in keeping Red River clean for all of our students. Um, he manages, he supervises, he plans, he ensures that the rest of the custodial staff knows what is expected of them. Like I say, the cleanliness of our building is of the utmost importance to Mike and the staff and keeping Red River a safe environment for all who enter. Our art teacher, Betsy, Betsy Thaden, says, Mike is a problem solver. He's flexible, works well under pressure with many interruptions. With uh, 1,100 kids and 150 adults in our building, there's a lot of things that happen. She said, I've had my sink drains plugged and he stopped what he's doing to clean and empty the trap box underneath the sink. I've had my key stuck in the door and he showed me a trick to get the key out so they can get before they can get it fixed. Um, I've had no hot water in which to wash my paintbrush and he has shown me two different ways in which the hot water disappears in that end of the building. Either the showers have been left on in the locker room or the autos has let the water run both hot and cold, which leaves art without hot water. So um, all the little tricks. She said one time it was November and the heat went out. We had boiler issues. Before she knew it, Mike had five space heaters in there in her classroom so our students can learn in a nice, warm, safe environment. Mike goes above and beyond for everyone in, this, in our building without disrupting the learning of our students. When teachers are going through their college classes, you're always told there are two people you must get to know quickly and become their best friends. It's the lead administrative assistant and the lead custodian. Those are the two that make the building go. And um, Mike is definitely that. Red River is blessed to have Mike as our facilities manager, his positive attitude and willingness to help everyone at the drop of a hat with his patented response, I'm on it, makes the most, I mean, he's most deserving of the classified employee of the quarter. And we are grateful that Mike is not only in the Grand Forks School District, but even more grateful that he's at Red River High School. So with that, congratulations, Mike, and thank you for all you do at Red River. It's a lot easier to do it than it is to hear that. <laughs> thank you. Next up, we have our um, certified employee of the fourth quarter, and her colleague, Badera, is going to introduce uh, Miss Christine Dewey. Good, good evening, everyone. My name is Badera Mohana. I am an EL teacher at Winship Elementary School. And I am here on behalf of Mr. Travis Thorvaldson, who couldn't be here tonight. He's the principal of Winship. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Grand Forks uh, Public School Certified Employee of the fourth quarter, Christine Dewey. Um, I have been working closely with Chrissy in the ELL department at Winship for almost a decade. And throughout these years, she has been a great example of a compassionate, caring, energetic teacher and a great team leader. Chrissy has been a vital member of Winship as she influenced the positive school culture with her compassion for teaching and connection with students, their families, and all staff. Her deep love and caring for her students 
students are evident in her everyday lessons, where she includes a variety of uh, activities to create an engaging learning environment that makes students excited about their learning. Chrissy is a culturally competent teacher. She understands the academic, social, and emotional uh, needs of our diverse student population, and she cares deeply about the student's well-being. She goes above and beyond to serve our students and their families. She doesn't hesitate to call families to share and celebrate their kids' success, remind them of upcoming events, or have a conversation with them about any situation that arises and helps them find solutions with her quick thinking and problem-solving skills. Uh, teach it. Teaching students from different cultures and backgrounds is a challenging task, but Chrissy is a gifted teacher who builds a strong relationship with all her students and makes them feel welcomed and belonging, which is key to their uh, learning success. Uh, Mrs. Dewey always finds ways to connect uh, students and staff to the Greater Grand Forks community. With her recent mini grant she received from the Grand Forks a Foundation for Education, she helped Winship students connect uh, to different people in the community, which builds positive experiences not only to our students and staff, but also for many members of our community. Uh, this grant also funded several community services and engagement uh, projects at every grade level at Winship School. Uh, Chrissy's positive demeanor, outgoing at, outreach attitude, um, excellent teaching skills, and fun personality makes her a great teacher and an invaluable asset to Winship School. Thank you, Chrissy, for all you do to our school and to the greater community, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, just like raising children, uh, raising kids, teaching kids is, takes a village. And I have amazing coworkers and administrators that support me and believe in me. And that makes my job and families, uh, my students and my families are truly a blessing to have in our community um, and make my job super special and super, I wouldn't say easy because Teaching is a difficult, there's days that are difficult, but the support I have from the staff and the families and the students um, makes me come to work every day and I love it. So I appreciate it, thank you. Congratulations to both of you, well, well deserved. And you can stay through the whole meeting or you can leave whenever you would like. So, <laughs> uh, Let's move on to item four, which is uh, approval of the January, or, I'm sorry, May 8th uh, minutes, uh, electronic pages four through six. Did anybody note any uh, additions, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, can I entertain a motion to approve the minutes? Moved by Josh, second? Second. Second by Joel. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the to our next item, which is public comments. And and uh, we're about to intervene in, into the public comment period of our meeting. Although state law does not require us to hold a public comment period, we have chosen as a board to do so because we believe it is crucial for us to hear from our community members about their concerns and issues. Having said that, please note that the board is here to listen. The public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. Accordingly, please do not expect the board to be able to respond to your concerns and questions at this time. I also want to point out that under state and federal privacy laws, we are unable to entertain any comments or questions about school personnel. Please know that we, we take personnel concerns very seriously. On these matters, we would ask that you go through the appropriate administrative channel. Finally, we recognize that right now in our nation and our community, the, the, we are polarized on a number of issues. Having said that, we want our school board meetings to serve an example uh, to our students 
whose members and those members of the school board and members of our community can deal with controversial issues in a civil manner and demonstrate mutual respect for one another. One another. Finally, we ask that the speakers address their comments to the board directly. And finally, I, I always want to remind everyone here in the room, but also uh, on YouTube, that you can always submit written comments to the board in lieu of speaking during the public comment period if you do to choose so. Um, uh, we have three people that want to speak tonight, and please limit your discussion to three minutes so that we can get to everyone. Uh, the first one is uh, Ron Barter. So I don't understand why this administration continues to thumb its nose at the primary stakeholders, and that is the parents. Not the children, the parents. I'm concerned with, with the, the vision or the perception that you are putting out there for the rest of the world. Um, based off of the school health hub, that you, the meeting you held today at 10 a.m., uh, we have four schools that are now participating in this program that is attempting to combat intersectionality, culturally responsive uh, responses, dismantling racism, removing barriers, and implementing social justice. So I would assume, based off of this, that Lake Agassiz, Wilder, Winship, and Valley has a race problem based off of what you're doing here. And that's, that's, that's pretty concerning. But honestly, I, I think you're more pushing an agenda than you are understanding and combating an issue. That's what, that's what I perceive. But they don't see that out there. They see that we have to employ this to combat racism and social justice. And if you're all educated, if you haven't learned that social justice is a fallacy, it's not justice at all, and it brings more conflict than any justice in any way, shape, or form, then you all might want to throw your degrees away because it's just common sense. Social justice is not justice. It's taking Lady Justice scales, putting your finger on it, and changing it. But now we have an organization coming in and creating a gender sexuality alliance club in three elementary schools. So we got porn in our schools, you want to keep that. Hopefully it's going away because of the law. But instead of, you know, we may lose that, so let's start with gender sexuality alliance clubs in elementary schools. My question, and I've emailed every one of you board members 12 questions. My question is, what's the driver? Are we wagging the dog here? What is it, what student requested a gender sexuality alliance club? See, social justice is very clearly CRT, and you're trying to avoid it by trying to rename everything. You may be trying to avoid it because you want to bring in UND to try and lead it. It's still CRT. It's ridiculous what we're doing. But why these four schools? They're all on the north side. Why are you focusing and fixating on indoctrinating the north side schools? You have my questions, hopefully I'll get a response. Ma'am, I didn't understand your response, but I sent it to Cindy anyway. I'm just looking for an answer, not for a policy. I, I have that part, thank you. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't read your last name. It, it's Lisa, sorry about that. I'm a little nervous here. My name is Lisa Carney, C-A-R-N-E-Y. Um, Dr. Bremer, Brenner and members of the school board, first let me add my congratulations on the success of the Valley Middle School vote. My remarks this evening are in regard to the West Elementary School property. The Grand Forks School Board voted several years ago to close West Elementary after a long and gallant fight by parents and the school's neighborhood to save it. It was a fine school with dedicated teachers and staff who educated generations of children. The property, which belonged to the people of Grand Forks, was purchased by Oxford Realty, which is owned by Mr. Michael Opp. 
for $150,000. It was assumed by the people of Grand Forks, and more importantly, West Elementary School neighborhood, that single family homes would be built on the site. Oxford, in fact, is building 10 single family homes. However, they are not going to be sold. They are going to be rented out, much to the disappointment of the homeowners of the neighborhood. I don't believe that there is anything that can be done at this point to stop that from happening. But in the future, when the school board decides to sell school property to a developer, language must be in place that ensures that if homes are built on a site, it would be stipulated as owner-occupied housing. Thank you. And our, our third speaker tonight is Amanda Kaplan. Hello and good evening and thank you for your time. I'm here to just voice um, the epidemic that we have in our kids' behavioral issues. And uh, you know, the you know every the everyday going on in the classrooms with behavioral issues and all the sorts of uh, anxiety, depression, uh, suicide. Um, and I would just like to promote mindfulness in the school systems and that I myself have been here since 2018 to try to implement mindfulness in the school system. I've been at Valley uh, Central, most of the elementary schools, in trying to implement just a program that offers uh, science-based wellness for neurology and helping rebalance the brain. And I'm seeing that what we are experiencing is just, um, I don't know if it's a lack of art or music or, you know, whatever it could be, but there are solutions. I was trained in Phoenix in what I do. And I was seeing schools all around the area just turning over from, you know, removing even metal detectors. So I came here in 2018 after sitting on it after a nine-year-old commits suicide. I graduated from Red River in 2003, so I have a calling. I feel like it's, it's my duty to kind of be here and stand with teachers, families, and children. I also don't feel like it's an extra responsibility for teachers to have another role as a mindfulness educator in the classroom. I believe they can be taught over time, but I'm here as a relief system to really try to help teachers facilitate, manage their own mental health as well as their classrooms. So if at all, I would love to be considered to help create a curriculum beyond, be based around the mental health of our community. And I believe that our children are our future and that we should really stand with them and do the best that we can in our power in a positive way to shine light on the problems that we're experiencing. Um, if, a little plug here, but Mindful Living Company is my business. I'm a licensed, trained educator. I have a background in K-12 education, um, ESL and uh, special needs, uh, but that wasn't really my fitting, so I am here now just trying to be a tool and to help with the problem. So thank you for allowing me to speak. I literally just found out about this meeting. I just said, I just want to go. I just want to go and share a voice that there are options and uh, I am here to help. So thank you so much. Thank you to the speakers for coming forward tonight. Let's move on to uh, item six, which is superintendent's recommendations for discussion. 6A is the Cognia celebration of Grand Forks Central High School. Uh, you have a, a slide deck on electronic pages seven through 14. Uh, Catherine. Thank you, Dr. Lund. So I'd like to uh, invite Denise Soren and Mr. Strandell, GFC's outstanding principal to the podium right now. So Ms. Soren reached out to me about a month and a half ago asking if she could come to a board meeting to celebrate success 
surrounding GFC's outstanding streak of being an accredited school system. 115 years straight, they have been uh, considered a highly qualified school that embraces innovative teaching practices, that uses data-driven um, strategies to make sure that they're in the process of continuous improvement. And Cognia used to be advanced ed, that may ring a big, bigger bell for you, um, and they are a state agency that, or our state commissioned agency that makes sure that every district across the state uh, engages in school improvement processes. So I'm going to pass the microphone over to the folks from Cognia and we can celebrate John Great. and his crew. Thank you so much. My name is Betsy Deal and I am the Vice President for Cognia's Midwest Region. I'm here with my colleague Denise Soren. Denise is the North Dakota Director for Cognia and we both had the privilege of being North Dakota educators for over 25 years each so I always feel excited that I can be here in my home state and um, present such an award. So thank you for giving us this introduction of who we are at Cognia. Um, to tell you a little bit more about the organization, we are a global non-for-profit continuous school improvement and accrediting company. We are the largest and oldest accreditor in the world. Um, we are over 125 years old. Some of you may have known us, known us from Advance Ed. Prior to that, um, NCA, and we've gone back in North Dakota quite a while, um, and we're excited to share that information. Um, Cognia is North Dakota's partner for continuous school improvement and accreditation. And we ask our schools and school districts to walk through rigorous standards and we support and partner them with best practice and provide them with feedback for their ongoing continuous improvement. So it's not just about saying a school has reached a mark that they are good enough. We love to partner with schools and districts like Grand Forks to ensure that we're always striving for continuous improvement and being a trusted partner in advancing that learning. So as I mentioned, we are over 125 years old. We work with over 36,000 schools and districts worldwide. We are in 95 countries. We work with 5 million teachers and over 20 million students. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do, um, and we're proud to be recognized as a regional accreditor in North Dakota. Our continuous improvement system really is um, centered on strategic thinking and that improvement planning process. And I'd like to just draw your attention to the outside circle of this um, infographic that we work with schools to imagine the possibilities for students. As students today in K-1-2 um, will be working into the next century, we ask that they partner and communicate well with their stakeholder groups. We get students, parents, teachers, the greater school community involved in this work and plot that journey together. We initiate the journey to ensure that everyone is moving in the same direction and we have a shared language and understanding about teaching and learning. And we support schools and districts in building capacity and momentum as they stop, take moments to pause and reflect and um, redirect course at times when needed. And that's all part of an interwoven um, improvement process. We have four pillars that we work closely with schools and districts through our accreditation and certification, through our assessment, measured progress, our improvement services, and our professional learning. So that's a little bit about who we are. Now I'd like to take you back to yesteryear. So just imagine with me um, over 115 years ago. The year was 1907. Oklahoma entered the Union as the 46th state. The Chicago Cubs beat the Detroit Tigers and the Tigers' 20-year-old Ty Cobb in the World Series. Harry Houdini escaped from chains underwater in 57 seconds at the Aquatic Park in San Francisco, California. For those of you who are music lovers, it was George M. Cohn's song, You're a Grand Old Flag. That was the happening music of the time. 
and 115 years ago, now 116 years ago, here in North Dakota, Grand Forks Central High School became accredited through NCA, which is now Cognia, and has been continually accredited with us in good standing all these years since. So we're happy, John, to have you here representing the high school to present you with this 115-year plaque. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll turn it over to you. Just a couple of thoughts here quickly, but as I was sitting before the meeting began thinking about the timeline for this and how strange it is to accept an award for the work that started in 1907 and just all of the folks that were doing continuous improvement at Grand Forks Central before we came along. So first of all, just to acknowledge all of those folks along the way that, that put in the time and effort to make Central what it is. Um, and then of course to thank the current folks who are leading the Cognia effort and at Central, that's Dr. Gabe Dahl with the support of, of Mike Wilbur. Um, they're working in concert together. I, I'm more of the HRS guy, so we're always working to align those efforts between Cognia and HRS and school improvement um, in, the, in the building. Uh, the, the second thing is to think, so we've been at this 115 years. Has anyone been at it longer than we have? Not in North Dakota. Okay. I, I, <laughs> that's, North, that's what I wanted to hear. Grand Fork Central were first three in Got you. If so, I wanted to know who we had to overtake and what we would do to do so. But anyway, anyway, congratulations to Grand Fork Central High Schools and continuous improvement, and thank you very much for your, for your recognition. Yes. Thanks again. So as we depart, we just thank you here at Grand Forks for allowing us to partner with you and for your commitment to continuous improvement. It's just been an honor and privilege tonight to be here with you at this board meeting and to see the awards that were given out. Uh, it was touching and it's just a testimony to the, the impact that your personnel has on one another and on students and that commitment to doing what's right for kids is just palpable here. So I congratulate you all on that. Thank you so much for allowing us to come. Thank you for being with us tonight. And John, congratulations to you and especially to your, all your staff that do the hard work. Appreciate that. So thank you. Let's move on to item 6B, which is the Social Studies K-12 Curriculum Resource Adoption. We have uh, Amy Bartsch, our Chief Academic Officer, and two of her fabulous colleagues with. And I'll tell you, there, there was a huge list of other people that have been working on this at each grade level. So I was, I was impressed with the sheer number. So uh, it's on electronic pages uh, 15 through 39. Amy, thank you for being here. That microphone's been, been touchy, so. Perfect. Okay, perfect, thank you. So Mr. President, members of the board, thank you for having us here tonight. And as Dr. Alon alluded to, there are many hands that go into a curriculum resource adoption. So at first, before we start, I'd like to just acknowledge some of the people that have really dedicated time and effort into this adoption. The next two slides are all about the teams of teachers who, in addition to their regular duties, have also been a part of the research pilot process. So a huge thank you to the K-5 team and then 612 team. And then, of course, without the fabulous Nicole Crafting and Lorraine O'Shea, the part where people don't see it's the invisible work, contacting vendors, sending up appointments, receiving in shipments, organizing information. So when teachers walk in, it's all ready to go and to explore. So a big thank you to all of those involved in the process. There's also another team that's not on here. It's our curriculum instruction and technology team, Jake Perper, the business office. Everyone plays a part in an adoption. It truly is is an organizational effort. So the first thing when we look at an adoption, the first go-to is the state standards. What do the standards require us to teach at each level, and how do we find resources that align to those standards? 
Also, in the last biennium, um, Senate Bill 2304 was passed, which requires all elementary and secondary public and non-public schools in the state to include curriculum on Native American history. This includes the implementation within the required North Dakota studies, which provides emphasis on geography, history, agriculture, federally recognized Indian tribes in the state in the fourth and eighth grade, one unit of United States history, which will also include Native American tribal history. I just wanted to highlight that because as we go through the adoption process, North Dakota is unique. So one of the asks that we'll have for your consideration is to allow an expenditure for teachers to look at the curriculum resource that they chose to adopt, but then infuse some of the state um, curriculum tools that they've given us into each of the grade levels. So on this slide, you can see that within North Dakota, they've developed the Native American um, Essential Understandings, as well as a resource called Teaching of Our Elders. And in your digital packet, you would be able to click on those headers and get a deeper dive into those. So again, part of our ask at the end of the presentation when we're going through and answering questions will be to look at that expenditure line. So through the adoption process, just to highlight a little bit of that, if you are a board member that's been with us before, you've seen this process, but I just wanted to highlight it again. The first is part is to research and evaluate. There are hundreds of different curriculum resources for every content area. So the first thing that we need to do is evaluate which one's best aligned to our state standards. And then we need to start discussions with those vendors. Are, is there a cost associated with the pilot? Typically, we try to negotiate our way out of that cost, and then we get all of the resources in, do a preliminary evaluation, and then we bring in teacher leadership teams to look and evaluate just by glance those resources, and then the really hard work starts. Teachers open those curricular resources, they align them to their everyday practice, they implement them with students, and throughout that, they're evaluating them to make a final recommendation. When we looked at social studies, these are the vendors that made it to the pilot process. So all of these vendors, we engaged in training with them, resource allocation, and then teachers implemented the resource within their classroom. And then as they were implementing, teachers looked and they first made sure that they aligned again with the state standards. While they were teaching, they were evaluating to see student reaction. Were stu students able to learn and access knowledge that they needed? Were they able to stay engaged? Then they reviewed them for the scope and sequence. How did the flow of content go? Was it appropriate for the age level? Were there tools for differentiation? They also reviewed the resource to represent, make sure it represented all people and was an anti-bias curriculum. They also looked for multiple forms of assessment. We know assessment goes beyond a paper, pencil, and a unit test. And then they went and they looked at an overall curriculum resource. How did it score? How did it meet the needs of their students? They do that through these curriculum adoption forms. Those are just some screenshots of examples of some of the comments. And then I'll turn it over to Nicole and Lorraine for a little bit to talk in depth about the resources. Thank you. Thank you, members of the board um, and Amy for that. I'm Nicole Crafting. I have been with Grand Forks Public Schools for 31 years, um, 28 of those in the classroom. So I, too, was part of some of these pilot projects in both fashions, from this side of the view, but also when I was in the classroom. So the first thing I do want to acknowledge, again, is the very dedicated time commitment that our teachers put in to really um, make sure we have picked the resource that is the best for our school district and our students. And with that, you can see up here a slide that shows their final recommendations. So the pie chart that is up there has the three resources that we piloted in depth, Studies Weekly, Inquiry Journeys, and the 2022 TCI edition. It is very apparent from this graph that the teachers were in consensus to the program, the resource they felt really met our needs. And that's the orange chart, the 92% um, that was voted on as the top ranking uh, resource that we used. Just a couple of the things on the side, there are some of the comments that teachers made. Um, a couple of them, 
For example, this resource is so flexible, it can easily be, easily be taught whether you have five minutes or 60 minutes, which we all know in an elementary classroom, you might just have five minutes some days. Um, having the materials all in one is a huge plus. It takes the guesswork out of each lesson. I'm also a fan of the online side for teachers. Another thing on the very bottom comment that I thought was important is that it said it felt that TCI took the best parts from each of the other curriculums that we looked at. It had the reading aspects and articles of the study weekly, but it also had the in-depth discussion and critical thinking of the inquiry journeys. Every different type of learner was able to have something that was beneficial to them. I think this would be the most successful for a specialist type of situation that we will be moving into next year. So we have on this slide um, for you to access, but we're just going to show a couple right now, some teacher and student video clips of a little of their feedback of why they thought TCI was the right choice. Um, our first one, and you know what, I'm thinking, uh, Miss Amy, that we added a, a clip on there. So we're gonna use Rachel Lisney here. She's a fourth grade teacher at Ben Franklin Elementary School. Hi, my name is Rachel Lisney. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Ben Franklin Elementary School. So TCI is very teacher and student friendly. The students can write and highlight, write the textbooks. The digital aspect was very interactive. It has all the activities right on it, which makes teaching and preparing for these lessons very time efficient. I use the digital resources with my kids a lot, and it saved a lot of time and printing. Our previous use of TCI allows the option to pull more resources if you want it. Um, and now two of my students will share a couple days about TCI. And Rachel, um, when she said our previous use of TCI, TCI is the resource that we currently have, but it is a 2010 edition. So quite a few updates have been made uh, when we look at this 2022. Here are two young students, kindergartners from Twining Elementary that want to share a lesson that they did the previous day. <laughs> Just like in Minecraft. <laughs> so they had to make their own clothes. So how do we get our clothes then? Do we from shave sheep? Factories. Some from factories. Do we have to make our own clothes? No. No. But if we want to, we Yes. <laughs> so what about water? How did they get water long ago? From lakes and rivers. And so how do we get it now? We get it from stores. Water? <laughs> <laughs> and then we turn on the faucet too, don't we? So did you like the lesson? Yeah. Yeah. What did you like about the lesson? How we how the wells. Wells. The wells. Yeah. Okay, well thank you guys. He said I liked the wells, so we was talking about the wells they used to get the water. Um, and I did like her, the, the young lady's little comment about um, getting to learn about long ago, but doing it right now. So that's really part of what this series does, is it brings a lot of what happened to life for kids, and they're able to experience it through inquiry um, and deep reading and understanding and thinking. So I'm going to pass it to Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this right. Oh, this one. There we go. 712 chose Savas, the My World's Interactive for Geography and American History, and then the U.S. History and Government um, and World History Interactive for uh, High School. And as you can tell in that uh, title, they're very interactive. I was really impressed, as were the teachers, with all the interactive um, features of the new platform. They're both fairly new. I think the U.S. Uh, 
high school curriculum is 2023, and the middle school one is 2022 or 2021. So it's really new. Uh, let me show you the comments. I don't have any cute videos, but <laughs> the teachers all asked th their students and gave feedback. So you can see there things about the graphics, but a lot of things about the project-based learning. They have quests in them, so they're doing some projects. As, as a unit culminator, they have lots of interactive pieces. Um, the high school curriculum has and the middle school has videos that take you right inside a piece of history, like uh, into the trenches of World War I foxholes. And they, you hear the sounds, you hear video, uh, audio recordings of, of what soldiers would be talking about. It's very, very interactive. Um, the students like the review pieces as well. Um, the vocabulary is uh, done in lots of fun ways and they use a lot of videos and audio. Alrighty, and this is for specialty courses. Most of our AP courses um, are, uh, have adopted BFW curriculum, which is a really uh, highly researched based AP curricula. Um, and they also chose Savas uh, government for their AP government classes, McGraw-Hill for sociology and econ, and then HMH uh, for psychology. And I think that's back to you. Okay, so really when we um, did our negotiations with vendors, these are the numbers that we ended up with. Um, the core resources, K through 12, would be $1,054,425.95. And you can see the breakdown between TCI and Savas. Remember, TCI is K6, Savas would be 712. And then on the right, the specialty courses, those are our AP courses. Um, and enriched courses, $198,875.44, with the breakdown by vendor underneath. Um, this goes to what I had talked about earlier with Senate Bill 2304. We would also like an allocation of dollars to pay teachers throughout the course of the next year or so to integrate the Native American essential understandings and the teaching of our elders into the curriculum. So give them time to look at what's there and then what needs to be added, supplemented, or augmented. Um, so really when it comes down to it's $24.73 per student per year because this is a seven-year adoption for all of the resources in totality. We have discussion and action, but we're just here for discussion today, so we we're happy to entertain any questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Yeah, as Amy pointed out, this will come back on June 12th for, for approval, so now is the time to clarify questions, comments, things like that, so I'll open it up for questions, comments. Go ahead, Monty. Thank you, ladies, for all your hard work. I know it's hard to go through an entire department, K-12, and align curriculum and scope and sequence of everything. I have a question, Lorraine, for you for the 9-12 um, social studies, history, sociology courses. So you said that those, um, the SAVAS materials are far more interactive. Does it mean that a student in regular 712 history or government, whatever they're at, will they still be carrying around a 52 pound book or will they have a link to something online? <laughs> they all will have online access. Um, many of the teachers opted for just classroom sets, but some of the courses they did ask for a book per student. And I think they do like to have them take it home from what I've learned from my colleagues who have kids in, in high school now, they'll take one home and have it at home. But it really is unnecessary because the digital access is like the ebook is really much better than the hardcover. If your grandpa is helping teach, though, grandpas like to have the actual books, just so <laughs> you know. Um, could, could one of you just comment before we open up to other questions about where the money is coming from, from this adoption, either Amy or Brandon or whomever? So the hope is ESSER 3, so this will count towards learning loss and be able to meet both of those criteria for ESSER 3. Thank you. Other clarifying questions, comments? Go ahead, Cynthia. Can you, can you remind us how, when the last social studies curriculum was adopted? So how long have they been using their current curriculum, please? I believe 2009. 
So well past the typical seven year adoption cycle. Somebody else in the room was a director of curriculum at that time. <laughs> and then there, were, there have been budget woes. So you can see uh, there's been a 14 year delay. Other clarifying questions, comments? Just to maybe put some urgency and attach to your question, um, our current TCI social studies is so old that they no longer support the digital platform for it. So this year we actually had to have the digital platform for the newer version because ours is so old. Amy, you may have said this earlier, but is this being planned to implement this fall? Um, yes, this upcoming fall. Go ahead, Monty. So will there be more, um, I know you have some money set aside for curriculum, especially to, to work with um, Senate Bill 2304, but is there any other kind of professional development opportunities for teachers with these new uh, curriculum materials? Yep, so I believe, if I'm remembering the calendar right, August 24th is a full day PD that will have social studies teachers will be extracted from that building department level, and they'll have their own based on each of those vendors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with the TCI resource, they also have an online component that is a, like a digital professional development that the teachers have access to throughout the year. So it has an online module that they go through at different points in their instruction to support them along the way as well as the beginning pieces. And Savas does have that now as well for you know, new teachers as they come in. So we'll upfront it on the 24th. And then they have that online piece that's just excellent. It really goes through it, and they can get, you know, prism hours even because it gives them a certificate as they finish it and tells us how many hours they've worked in it. And then each of the vendors after those online will do a live drop in what questions you have, what understandings weren't clear. So that's a part of the negotiation package that we do with them is to get those pieces included. Any, any further? Go ahead, Cynthia. So you highlight the Native American, but I'm, mm -hmm. I have a feeling there are other areas. Can you just touch on a few other highlights of what the, this new curriculum, new book offers? Because, I mean, there's been a lot happening since right. 2000. I think it op offers updated, and that's the bonus of having digital resources is that as history evolves and things change and we have new understandings, that digital online access evolves as well. Um, much like 2304, that's one subset or one group of people. And the, as we go through, part of the charge of our teachers was to look at what was presented and make sure it was an accurate depiction of history. And so that's something that teachers were looking for and making sure that stories were told from numerous points of view and all of these resources have that. Will there be evolution as we go through a seven-year adoption? I would anticipate so. And that's where all these vendors make that resource change digitally. Amber. Um, HRS, is there a component of that that requires or, or has some sort of next step as it relates to um, updating curriculum throughout the school district? Maybe an indirect correlation. So level two, when you think about effective teaching in every classroom kind of is based on the new art and science of teaching and those instructional strategies and they're used when appropriate. But when you get to level three, it talks about a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And then it also talks about how that curriculum resource is used to meet the needs of all students. So as we look at our changing group of students and their needs, one of the requirements of a resource is that it's able to be malleable enough to meet all needs. So I can differentiate to meet learners who need extension, but then also those who need remediation. Any final questions, comments? Amy, if, if somebody has an aha moment mm -hmm. in three days, can they, can, they, can they reach out to you rather than wait till the next board meeting if they've got something Absolutely. in? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you, and thank the rest of the team that has done all the hard work as well. So appreciate it. Let's move on to uh, item seven, which is superintendent's recommendations for action. 7A is the consent agenda. It's on electronic pages 40 through 49.
Can I get a motion and a second for the consent agenda? So moved. Move, motion by Dave. Second. Second by Cynthia. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, seven B, C, D are all waiver of years of experience uh, on electronic pages 50, 51, and 52, Dr. Brenner. Thank you, Dr. Lund. On page 50, uh, Nika Nawakafur has been offered the position of Head Start teacher at the Head Start Center effective July 1, 2023. It's considered a hard to fill position as these have been brought to you on a regular basis. So I'll just go down to the final paragraph. Uh, given the information about the hard to fill position, administrative rec recommendation is to allow 17 years of experience to be brought into the district by Nika Nawakafur and to approve her teaching appointment. She would be placed at 62,015, a BA plus 30, step 18, subject to change following teacher contract bargaining. Can I get a motion and a second? So motion by Cynthia to have second. second. Second by Monty. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to 7C. Melanie Parcio has been offered the position of Special Education Strategist at Valley Middle School, effective July 1, 2023. Again, hard to fill position. I'll move to the final paragraph. Uh, given the aforementioned, the administrative recommendation is to allow 14 years of experience to be brought into the district by Melanie Parcio, and to approve her teaching appointment should be placed at 57,227, which is a BA plus 30, step 15, subject to change with teacher contract bargaining. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion by Bill. Second, second by, Dave, by by Joel, by by a half a millimeter second. So, uh, any clarifying questions? Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to uh, Jessica Sundin. And the final one, Jessica Sundin's been offered the position of special education teacher at Valley Middle School, effective July 1, 2023. Uh, given the aforementioned, the administrative recommendation is to allow 12 years of experience to be brought into the district by Jessica Sundin and to approve her teaching appointment. She would be placed at 45918 an 80% contract uh, with an MA Step 13 subject to change with teacher contract bargaining. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion by Jeff, second by Josh. Any clarifying questions? Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you all. Let's move on to item 7E, which is the general fund financial statement. We have our business manager, Brandon Bombach, here. It's on electronic pages 53 through 62. Thank you, Brandon. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Lund, members of the board. Um, this is the normal report here in our through our 10 months of the general fund. We saw revenues of 102 uh, almost 103 million over expenditures of 87 million. Um, that puts those revenues over expenditures at 15.7 million. As you walk through the report, you'll note not much has changed here at this time of the year. Um, the numbers um, come in steadily. Um, uh, on that second report, starting on electronic page 57, is where you will note those comments. Those are similar from um, previous months here. And ultimately, on electronic page 60, 61, and 62 provide a graphical representation of where revenues, expenditures, and overall general fund balance currently sits. And again, in these coming months, we'll see that draw down towards July. Um, I went through that one kind of quickly because there wasn't a lot of new items from the last month. Administrative recommendations to approve the general fund statement as presented, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Clarifying questions or comments from board members. I just have one. Are, are we anticipating the Indian fund balance will be about where we thought it was going to be? Yeah, there's a couple of things we're watching. <clears throat> As noted in here is that we see more with our substitute teachers, and, and looking at that, it's, um, I, th I suspect, the designated subs position are a little bit more. And also, we've had more vacancies this year in general among the certified staff that are probably driving those numbers. So um, yes, but um, more to be seen yet. Other clarifying questions or comments? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve the general fund financial statement for the period of July 1, 2022 through April 30, 2023? Motion by Bill, do we have a second? 
Second by Dave. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to item 7F, which is consideration of proposals to provide gasoline. Electronic page 63, Brandon. Uh, President Lund, members of the board, <clears throat> um, each year we put out advertisement uh, to um, solicit the best prices for gasoline, both in town and out of town. On April 11th, you provided the approval for administration to do so, and this is the result from that um, bidding process. You'll notice that we had three bids here, and the administrative recommendation is to accept two of those proposals. Um, first and foremost, one from B1 Incorporated, or DBA's Gateway Senex, for in-town refueling, as they have offered a 10 cent discount at the pump. Mm -hmm. And for when we're over the road or a little further away from Grand Forks, Circle K or Holiday Corporation um, has bid a seven cent discount at the pump. And so administrative recommendations to uh, accept both of those bids. Clarifying questions or comments for Brandon. Seeing none, can I get a motion to accept the recommendation? Motion by Jeff, do we have a second? Second by Cynthia. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to 7G, which is consideration of bids for the sale of bus. Electronic page 64. President Lund, members of the board, very similar uh, memo written here because at the same April 11th meeting, you provided um, direction to administration to solicit bids for a, a 2017 Ford E450. It's a people mover bus that has no longer been in use at all for the school district. And we solicited bids to sell that bus and we received three. Um, one uh, from the Listen Center here in Grand Forks, another a little further away from commercial bus and vehicles, and then um, locally from an individual of Derek Sportbird. You can see the um, Strongest of those bids was from the Listen Center at 16000 so administrative recommendations to accept that bid so we can sail, sell those buses, that bus um, for $16,000. Excuse me. Clarifying questions for Brandon? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve that? So motion by Joel. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Josh. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to 7H, which is consideration of property insurance bids, electronic pages 65 through 71. Brandon. Dr. Lund, members of the board, each year we are going, I, should, I know, when you, get, when you get a few agenda items in a row, it sounds a little funnier. Uh, each year we, um, we work with Bauer Insurance and have for many years as our broker to provide us with the best insurance quotes that are available. Um, this year is no different in that. Um, today we are I'm providing a little bit more information. It's more inclusive than just the property insurance, but the property insurance is what is uh, the question at hand or decision for the board, as it is the one that exceeds the $50,000 mark. Outside of the exception, when we receive insurance coverage from the North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund, that we have no bidding requirements, um, and we do participate with them. You'll see here that we did receive these bids. We had received both a renewal bid for property insurance from Travelers, which is our current policyholder, and also a new bid from Liberty Mutual Insurance. Uh, one thing before I go on to the next page, which is electronic page 66, I'll just note over the past two years, we've worked to increase our total blanketed building values. Um, it was with recommendation from Valor that we could we should ask for a little more coverage in the case of an event as you do every so often. So we've increased the values um, almost a million dollars from um, where we were prior to renewal last year into where we will be this year. It's important to note because that can affect these rates. Um, all told, I'm, I'm happy with the result when it comes to property insurance. You'll note or how to read this here now as we move on to electronic page 66 is there are a number of columns and they're kind of grouped in two. So on the far left is the listing of the property insurance. And as we move to the right, if you note the dates, you'll see that the first two columns are traveler's current policy. That's what's expiring. <clears throat> and then the next two columns would be what their renewal bid is. 
And as we move to the right, you'll see the Liberty Mutual option presented to the board. The final column are just some comments. And so even with the additional value that's being covered, um, you can see the traveler's bid increased um, $40,000, whereas that mutual, uh, Liberty Mutual increased a little bit more, 441. What's to note there is just below the next grouping of rows, if you follow me, is equipment breakdown insurance, whereas the, the coverage quoted by Liberty Mutual is inclusive or included in um, the property insurance. So that makes um, all the difference. And as you go further down, you can see some of the other insurance coverages that are offered. Um, the only other change here, and not for a decision at this board, is Inland Marine Insurance. Um, uh, North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund came with a more competitive bid uh, response than travelers. So if you go down to the final page, or the, the final page, I will I will remark on page 68 of the electronic packet. You'll see the total quote moving in the same direction from left to right in a row labeled total annual premium. You'll see currently we paid insurance of 488000 With the renewal quote from travelers, you see 586000 And despite the increase in values, <clears throat> Liberty Mutual was able to keep their increase to a total of 496922 so administrative recommendation is to accept the bid response from Liberty Mutual Insurance for our property insurance coverage this next fiscal year. Clarifying questions or comments from board members? Go ahead, Amber. Does this include um, taking on any new buildings? Like if we were to purchase a bus barn or something like that, um, how do they... Uh, add that into a, a liability or an asset that we have under our insurance policy? Yeah, e each year we do update our, our list of property that needs to be insured. And um, so that conversation started prior to what is included here. If, if a, the purchase goes through on a bus barn, then we would simply reach out to Voller and make that adjustment. And based on the, the value of that building, um, which an appraisal will be coming in for, we'll just correct this, and it will go up some amount, I'm unsure. Other clarifying questions or comments? Brandon, I noticed that uh, on the uh, liability limits, it's, it's higher for mutual than it is for travelers. Is that, is that a, a, a bigger deal or an advantage since they, their limit is $3 million versus two for the other? Yeah, and um, actually, we had I'd gone back and forth a little bit with legal on that, and uh, you know, some districts will keep it at two, and some will want three. And through dis discussions with both legal and our insurance provider, uh, I directed them to include that or to increase that limit to three million. It's a it's a coverage that um, I'm convinced, working with our vendors, that we'd be more comfortable with. Thank you. Any further clarifying questions? Seeing none, can I entertain a motion to accept the administrative recommendation as outlined? So moved. Motion by Cynthia. Do we have a second? Second. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay, let's give Brandon a break. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to 7i, which is appointment of, but don't go far because you're the next one. Uh, appointment of Buildings and Grounds Director, Electronic Pages 72 through 75, Dr. Brenner. Thank you, Dr. Lund. I'm just going to take you through the memo so I don't uh, have any missteps along the way. Uh, I'm pleased to recommend Mr. Jonathan Elwine as our new Director of Buildings and Grounds. Uh, while we had advertised the position of Facilities Engineer following the interviews and meeting with Mr. Elwine, we are collectively comfortable, that's Mr. Elwine included, with using the position title of Director of Buildings and Grounds. Uh, presently, Mr. Elwine is the Maintenance Director for CNW Services Core Scientific and is home based in Grand Forks. Uh, Mr. Elwine, Elwine brings a wealth of project management experience to the workplace and is highly proficient with software programs that track projects from beginning to end with an anticipated cadence to each project. Mr. Elwine was interviewed on April 19th along with two other candidates, all of whom brought a unique skill set to the position. 
Following the interviews of all candidates, the committee brought back Mr. Elwine for a second interview on April 25th, where he demonstrated commendable presentation skills and responded to follow-up questions from the interviewing team. Notable skills that will assist him in being successful in this macro level position are uh, simultaneous management of multiple facilities, of which he presently does, training and coaching of employees, which he has experience in, asset management strategies, main, uh, maintenance budgeting, safety and inspection processes, and he's proficient with software programs and programming. You can see the interviewing team uh, is listed below, Eric Holm, maintenance supervisor. By the way, Eric has been outstanding as our interim for the last several months. Um, he has carried heavy, heavy buckets of water uh, in collaboration with uh, Brandon Mombuck. And Brandon was on the interviewing team, Griffin Gillespie, HR, uh, myself, Eric Ripley, uh, Kelly Nice, who was uh, with Buildings and Grounds, Dr. Chris Harrison, who you saw earlier tonight, Dave Nowatsky, the principal at Schrader, and Kelly Tannehill, principal at Kelly. We used a scoring rubric, and Mr. Elwine graded out as the candidate of choice. The administrative recommendation is to approve Mr. Jonathan Elwine as our new director of buildings and grounds at an annual salary of 113393 which may be adjusted following the director's and school board team contract bargaining process. Should you approve this appointment, Mr. Elwine is prepared to commence his position tomorrow, May 23rd, 2023. So he's taken a chance on how the board will vote this evening. Thank you. Clarifying questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve this appointment? Motion by Joel, do we have a second? Second. Second? Assuming, a, uh, that was Josh, by the way, sorry. Uh, assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Sorry, Brandon, we're back to you. Uh, 7J, consideration of student transportation services agreement with Valley Bus, electronic pages 76 through 120. Um, thank you, President Lund. Members of the board, there are three closely associated agenda items here in a row, but starting with this important one, on April 24th, the board selected Valley Bus as the school district student transportation services um, beginning on July 1, 2023 for a three-year term through June 30, 2026. Um, since that time, we've been working with Valley Bus on the terms of the contract um, to pull this all together. Um, outside of what would be expected within that scope of contract, I just wanted to note in the outset that we've been discussing also about the purchase of the bus barn that is currently owned by Dietrich, but then also um, a a purchase of the buses owned by Dietrich for a short-term basis. And I'll explain that a little bit more further. Um, the agreement itself is relatively reflective of a lot of the terms and um, a lot of the terms that used before within Dietrich and the specific routes are similar and reflective of what currently is. Um, so we're this agreement, I think, will accomplish a smooth transition for when students are last um, transported by Dietrich on June 29th, perhaps, till when they are beginning transportation with Valley Bus Service. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions here. The agreement itself is attached as well as what was requested when um, the um, response for quotations was first sent out and the addendum associated. Clarifying questions or comments from board members? Go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, just clarification, you mentioned temporary. Did, did temporary use of the Dietrich buses, did you explain that? Uh, short term. And so the, the process would be, so Dietrich has been a great partner in this, and, and so has Valley Bus, and so negotiating or working through some of the, the details of the transition to make sure it's smooth. The bus barn, longer term interest on behalf of the district. The bus is, um, don't believe the district wants to be in owning buses, but through conversations to make this, again, a smooth transition, we'd be looking at a municipal lease where the school district owns those buses, um, but after a year, it's already negotiated on the outset that Valley buys those buses from us. And the purpose being smooth transition, as they come to Grand Forks, they get into a new building, they get into new um, assets such as buses, and 
um, new staff, new bus drivers. So just a detail, you, they all say Dietrich bus right now, I believe. So Yeah, and so a part of this is we would immediately lease those buses and the building back to Valley Bus. And so they would assume those like a triple net lease. Maintenance, everything about them would be completely on them. So there's, there's leases to be worked out with this too. So my assumption would be they would say Valley Bus on the side. And they would pay for the signage yes. change? Yep. Further clarifying questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, uh, um, do we get a motion and a second? We got a motion by Bill, do we have a second? second? Second by Cynthia. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no, motion carries. Let's move on to item 7K, which is consideration of purchase agreement for the bus barn, electronic pages 121 through 128. Brandon. Thank you, Dr. Lund, members of the board. And if I can just offer um, one more insight with Valley Bus, I'd recently heard them present uh, in person to current Dietrich employees, um, easing any concerns for what that transition may look like. And I was very impressed by the way they operated. The owner was present. They had brought all of their team members that would be um, core to the operation, and they had answers for all questions. They had assurances for all concerns, and they prided themselves. One thing I took away was on their ability to hire non-CDL drivers, train them in-house because they've gone and sought those credentials, and um, make them great employees. And so they're not marketing just to the CDL market that's out there, they say, you're going to be a part of our team and trained up. So I, for one, wanted to share the excitement for working with them. And of course, that couples with um, with the appreciation for Dietrich, not only in this process now, but having worked with them for the past year so. On this agenda item here, um, this is reflective of our conversation recently about purchasing the bus barn. This is a purchase agreement that we've worked with um, legal services, Laura Cobb, here to put in order. This would be, um, pro be providing a tight timeline here. I wanted to put this in front of us. It is contingent on a couple of key things, including an appraisal to come back. So this has a negotiated price of $725,000, but um, if an appraisal comes back with less, then we would talk through that. It's also um, um, subject to some of the equipment purchases. We need to work that out. So knowing that we have the one board meeting left here in, in June 12th, I wanted to provide assurances to vendors and yourselves that we have all this squared away and the request would be your approval tonight so that way administration can move um, quickly to make sure that there's a smooth transition at the end of the fiscal year. Clarifying questions for Brandon. Go ahead, Amber. Do we know who's doing the appraisal? Um, I had ordered that through First International Bank. Okay, so it's through the bank. Okay, yep. thank you. Other clarifying questions or comments from board members? Go ahead, Cynthia. I don't know if this is appropriate, but what's the condition? What's the condition of this bus barn? Right. No, it's absolutely appropriate. So I myself have been over there, but um, also I had our maintenance supervisor Eric Holm walk through, as well as even prior to the appraisal and and as far as far in the negotiations as we've been, um, oh boy, uh, Crary Real Estate has an in-house commercial side. Um, Mr. Bone, I apologize. It, and, and they provided a, a quick assessment of that. The bus barn itself is straightforward building in that it's, and I wish I had my words to describe it a little better than what I'm doing right now, but three bays, relatively straightforward with some office space. It has some equipment that'd be a part of that. Um, some bolted down, some not, but um, air compressors, um, hot um, pressure washer for the buses themselves. And so the building itself is in good working order um, from all assessments so far. And two, it sits on a lot, a little bit larger, fenced in properties. Much of that is um, concrete apron and there is some gravel near the west side of that lot. So from all assessments so far, it's been, you know, um, a good condition. 
So when, when a bus needs to be repaired, do they do that in the bus barn? Do they take it to a mechanic? They do. I, I assume there might be some conditions where they need to go outside, but um, Valley as well as Dietrich, but Valley has their own mechanic team. And again, through that lease, um, the lease between um, Grand Forks Public Schools and Valley, that would be on them to maintain those buses. Further clarifying question? Go ahead, Amber. Perhaps when the Career Impact Academy gets up and going, they could just drive it through if they need it and the students can work through it. Um, because you mentioned it, Query Real Estate, are we p paying for that service or is that an in-house assessment? We paid, I think, $650 okay. for that service. The only reason I ask is because there's a, a clause on the contract that says this purchase, we haven't used a, the assistance of a real estate agent. And so I just want to sure. make sure that that's okay. Okay. Further, further clarifying questions or comments? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve the administrative recommendation? Motion by Bill, do we have a second? Second by Jeff. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to 7L, consideration of resolution authorizing negotiation of school bus acquisition, electronic page 129, Brandon. Um, Dr. Len, members of the board, again, the continuation of similar conversation. This as it relates to the, the purchase of buses and other personal property on site, including um, spare parts, um, air compressor, and uh, a few other things. This here is just a resolution similar to last time ahead of the building purchase that would allow administration to seek what financing pricing would look like and to actually negotiate the deal. So this would allow for us to go to banks and, and work with them for a municipal lease. It's an interesting mechanism, slightly different than what we used in the past, where we would be the owners of the bus, Grand Forks Public Schools would be listed on title, um, but those titles would be held at the bank and we would be leasing from the bank for the year before it's sold. This would allow for Dietrich to exit from that sale, which is something that they're very interested in, and allow for Valley to immediately start to use those without any concern for in insurance between the two companies or concern for insurance and liability for ourselves as these would be operated and maintained completely by um, the Valley bus. Um, so this uh, North Dakota Century Code allows for the municipal lease for school buses in particular, up to six years. And so we could work through and look at the financing of whether we stretch it out, amortize over those full six, even though we know we're gonna sell after one. But the agreement with Valley would be the expectation to sell those buses after year one and buy us out of that lease. Again, the purpose ultimately is to help them make sure they have a soft landing here and transition so we don't you know, miss a single day of kids getting to school on time. Clarifying questions, comments from board members? If not, can I get a motion to approve the resolution authorizing negotiation of school bus acquisition? Motion by Jeff, do we have a second? Second by Dave. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Let's move on to item 7M, which is Grand Forks Central and Sacred Heart Boys Tennis Cooperative Agreement. It's electronic pages 130 through 134. Catherine's going to lead us in that, and we have our activities director, Mike, here as well. So, Catherine. Thank you, Dr. Lund. I'm actually going to volley right on over to <laughs> Director Biermeyer there. Thank you. Thank you. See what I did there? Yep. All right, I said nice segue there. Appreciate that. So, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, considering this cooperative agreement that we've asked for with uh, Boys Tennis between Sacred Heart and Grand Fork Central. We have, as the information has there, we have, we have many cooperative agreements in many different sports. This seems like a good fit. And uh, just a little background where I came from in Thiefura Falls, we have numerous cooperative agreements. <clears throat> so one thing I want to stress is, is our, our number one 
uh, you know, fans or people that we're, we're, you know, we're representing is our students in our school districts here in Grand Forks. However, when there is opportunities to create those for other school districts nearby, we think it's a good idea for us to be good stewards of that opportunity. And I think this is one of those. So I'm just here to answer some questions that you may have on the reasons for the cooperative or anything else. I'll open it up to clarifying questions or comments from board members. Go ahead, Cynthia. So I'm not familiar with this. So when the, when the uh, Sacred Heart student is playing tennis, they're playing for Sacred Heart. No, they are. They play for, you just said that they, they play for our school. They play for our school district. Uh, in this particular case, it would be Grand Forks Central. So it'll be, they'll play for Knights. They will represent Knights. Um, we work out an agreement because sometimes there are some unique differences with some rules and regulations, especially when you're crossing borders with academic eligibility, chemical violations. So we work that out where we don't have, we don't have those situations where if you have teammates that have the same academic eligibility, they're sitting different terms. So we, we do think of all those little details like that that we work out. So this is similar probably to swimming because swimming has, I, mean, I don't know if it is. But swimming has kids from other schools as well, so they're all they're all swimming for Grand Forks, right? Correct. So it'll be very similar to all of those, and sometimes we don't even quite know that some of the students are from a different community. I mean, they're they're in essence they are swimming and representing their school district because people know who they're who they are, but from a greater picture, they're representing one of our schools. Dr. Shab, if you refer to page 134 of the packet, there's a whole slew of cooperative agreements that are listed there that we currently embark in with uh, surrounding districts. I just needed to kind of get it in my head what it looks like. It, it, it wasn't there on paper for me. I apologize. That's okay. And one thing we do look at is, you know, the number of kids participating. We don't want to bring in a large number of cooperative students that would displace some of our students. So those are some of the other things we think about. Um, if you can look at the, the list maybe is what you have. Um, Sacred Heart, we have a number with them, in particular uh, with tennis girls. So we kind of look at that parallel uh, with some of those sports. We don't want to have a cooperative agreement with Thompson, you know, when we don't have, or, or in other words, Sacred Heart boys to go to Red River when the girls are going to Central. Um, and the way I understand some of the cooperative agreements in the past have been, as you can see, the vast majority of those from the Sacred Heart are going to go to Central, unless there's a unless there's a in-house cooperative agreement like with swimming, gymnastics, and and girls wrestling. So we've kind of already established those schools of East Side, Grand Forks, and Sacred Heart are going to be going to Central. But if Thompson were to come in some of those things, um, they're going to be going to Red River, like in swimming, girls, and wrestling boys. So kind of just get a well a well rounded picture there, so hopefully you can get a good idea. Amber, are there any fees associated with like Sacred Heart paying helping to pay for our coaches or with any of these agreements? Are there? That's a yes and no. Okay. So the, the <laughs> students are going to pay their the, the fee that we establish, and they pay that to us. However, there's there's an ownership there that we're going to take the expense and burden of those coaches, but then we also take the ownership of we decide who the coaches are. Um, transportation, they get over here. You know, Unless we're gonna run through Grand Fork or East Grand Forks, we would pick them up. Thompson, we, we do scoot through Thompson, we pick up our students there instead of having them come all the way up and go right back down the interstate. But there's a, there's a in my experience, there's a, there's a big piece to that ownership of we decide how the program's gonna be it is going to be Grand Forks Central Knights, not a cooperative name. It is our colors, so it's still our ownership. That way we say, we'll take care of it. Yeah. Any further clarifying questions or comments? If not, can I get a motion and a second to approve the administrative recommendation? So. Motion by Dave. Second. second by Joe. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Let's move on to item 7N, which was the one that was at your, at the table side, which is the uh, uh, construction management at risk delivery method for construction of a new Valley Middle School centralized 
Kitchen and Security, uh, Brandon. Dr. Lund, members of the board, um, it's with a great deal of excitement that the referendum passed and, and come the next steps involved uh, with no time to waste. So the district's moving forward with the new Valley Middle School and Centralized Kitchen as well as upgrading those safety and security features across the district. And therefore, we need to take steps um, for the school board to consider um, determination that the construction manager at risk is the proper, de proper delivery method and authorize the administration to form a selection committee. So here outlines um, in your memo just a little bit of the authority involved here. Um, it's, it's worth just repeating just what a CMAR agreement is. The construction manager at risk means a public improvement delivery method through which a construction manager provides advice to the governing body during the planning and design phase of, of a public improvement. They help negotiate a contract with the governing body for the general construction bid package of the public improvement and contracts with subcontractors and suppliers for the actual construction of the public improvement process. Um, as noted in Century Code, we want to make sure we understand that and understand why this is beneficial. Um, in accordance there, uh, it points out that this needs to be in the best interest of the public. Um, it also, we need to provide assurances that the planning and design services will not duplicate what are normally provided by architects and engineers. And even during the construction services, there will not be duplication of what's provided by, from the architect and engineer contract. Um, the memo provides the response to why this is beneficial. Um, in short, you know, it, it generally will help us reduce expenditures uh, and, and overall exposure within the construction process, provide resources to ensure quality and timely project, um, can help with a more open bid process as they select those subcontractors, um, and then it'll help us with a single point of contact throughout all of this. So uh, the CMAR provides us expertise to make sure we're on time and under budget throughout a very complex um, process. So that's part one, and the administrative recommendation would be that the school board does make those following determinations, that it's in the best interest, it's, it's not duplicative in planning and design services, and it's not duplicative in construction services. A second part of this is that once that vehicle as a CMAR is established, the, the board also establishes a selection committee for which organization or company will, will be that CMAR. And that's the second part of the memo here. Um, administrative recommendation is to um, elect to use this, or in addition to the election to use that, um, we'll provide a selection committee, which is, again, in Century Code, is defined. It needs to be composed of an administrative individual from the governing body, a registered architect, a registered engineer, and a licensed contractor. Of those three I just mentioned, they'd also not want to be in a position to be competing for this. So we would be selective of these expertise where they wouldn't have any conflict of interest involved. <clears throat> what this group will do is they'll establish content for the request for qualifications and provide for the submittal procedures for request of qualif qualifications. So they'd help us send out the information, or this group would help um, um, provide the content for what will be included within that request for qualifications for the CMAR and then go through the public notice process. <clears throat> um, in addition to the single administrative individual from the governing body, um, it'd be our intention and, and my intention as administration to, to um, provide that the superintendent be involved with this process, that myself be involved with this process, the interim BNG director, Eric Holm, be involved as on this selection committee, and as well as the newly minted building and grounds director, Jonathan Elwin, be involved with this. So for the second part, administrative recommendations to authorize administration to form this selection committee, um, which would be comprised of those individuals. So two actions involved with this memo. Yeah, we'll do two separate actions, but we probably can just open it up for questions or comments about any of it. I know CMR, CM, CMR is kind of state of the art. Uh, Altree's been using it. UND's been using it. It's, it's, it's a common procedure that's being used in the construction trade now. So clarifying questions or comments from any of the board members.
Go ahead, Cynthia. I feel like tonight is my night just to show how much I don't know, but that's all right. I can handle it. Okay, so this construction management at risk, I appreciate the definition. So it's a governing body. It's not just one person that oversees the building processes? It's not one person, and it's not a governing body. It's a private company that will respond to provide these services. So whenever you have a project that must be managed, you can do this internally. And, and for our school and our capacity, that makes sense for smaller projects. And then we would not incur any additional fees for somebody else doing that for us. But you can also get into construction management agreements where they take on a certain uh, amount of that liability, but a construction manager at risk takes on the most. And we're essentially will, would be in a position to negotiate a contract where there's a ceiling. And so they're helping us by they're selecting the contractors and they're taking on the risks and liabilities of those decisions. And so there becomes a ceiling that if things go you know, the wrong direction, that's their responsibility, not ours. And with a project this big and complex, it's with a um, administrative recommendation that we do take that course. Thank you. Other clarifying questions or comments? Go ahead, Monty. I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm like Cynthia. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So, is this? If I like, we're building a house, and I I hired Cindy to be my project manager. Is it kind of not the same, but is it sort of like that? She's going to make these decisions and say, "Hey, I hired this person to do your plumbing, and this person's going to do your electrical." Yes. That's right. So you have a central point of contact who's in charge of the mechanical, the electrical, all of those subs. But it's even a greater degree of sophistication, and the North Dakota Century Code outlays all these parameters because of it. Because, again, we're we're provided the assurance that they are the ones at risk in this process, and not us. Mm -hmm. Further clarifying questions or comments? If not, the 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 first motion would be to uh, that the that the school board had made the following determinations, which is. D, E, and F on the back page. I'd entertain a motion for that first. Motion, motion by Bill. Do we have a second? Second by Monty. <coughs> Any further clarifying questions? Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. So the, the next uh, motion would be for um, a selection committee, and the selection committee would be made up of Dr. Brenner, Brandon, uh, Eric Holm, and then our new Buildings and Grounds Director that was approved earlier tonight. And they would they would be responsible for, for forming the selection committee. And questions about that? Maybe maybe just one clarity. Go ahead. Yeah, please do. If it's okay. I'll be looking for the approval that the administration get to go ahead to form that selection yes. committee. Those would be the intended parties with the architect, engineer, and contractor, not by name yet, but it would give us the authority to form. Yeah, by state law, those are the positions that you have to have on that committee, correct? You have to have an architect, an engineer, contractor, right. correct? And the only nuance I want to point out is it's less of you naming those people to the committee as much as giving us the authority to establish that that uh, committee, yeah. if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. For, for, go ahead. Make a motion to... Um, Authorize administration to form a selection committee with the the four people designated. Do I have a second? Second. Wow. I, uh, Jeff, I have better hearing from my right ear. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. Thank you, Brandon. Take a, take a breath till exec session. Uh, let's move on to uh, item 8, 8 A's announcements. I've got a few. Um, uh, on behalf of the board, I want to congratulate Dave Berger for his bachelor's degree from the university last week. And, and if you haven't read the article, you should read the article. It's an excellent article about it. So thank you, Dave. So, uh, secondly, the school board self-evaluation uh, is we're currently in collecting data and it needs to be in by Friday, May 26th at 4 p.m. So if you haven't, if you, 
it, I know Cindy sent out a link. I can't remember when that was. I did mine over the noon hour. Uh, but Cindy sent out a link to, to complete your uh, school board self-evaluation, and the deadline is 4 p.m. on Friday. The third one is, uh, you know, we have to have a special school board meeting on May 29th to certify the results. And uh, Cindy sent out a, an availability reminder, so if you haven't responded back to her about whether you can attend that meeting, please do. We do need a quorum for that, and unfortunately it's at 6 p.m., on Monday Memorial Day, so so we need at least we need at least five to do that. So, by Zoom. And, oh, and it's by Zoom, and it's going to be like a like a five minute meeting. It's going it'll be a short meeting. I will not be there. I'll be in an airplane somewhere. So, and then the last thing I just wanted to point to remind everybody is that we have a school board retreat on June eighth and 9th, which is a Thursday Friday. So just um, we've had it on our calendars, but just as a, as a reminder. So. Dr. Brenner, do you have any announcements? Yeah, I have two. I just want to publicly thank Brandon Bombach for his leadership with the referendum. Uh, he started his day at the Alaris Center last Tuesday at 6 a.m., and he did not leave until close to 10 p.m. Uh, lots of compliments from all of the poll workers uh, talking about how available Brandon was and how organized he was. Uh, and, and another shout-out to our B&G staff who moved all the equipment over there in the morning uh, to get all the, the voting, the, the booths up and uh, getting all those set up and then the teardown process as well. Uh, and, and secondly, I just want to thank Brandon for how well he articulates at the board table uh, all of the items that he had this evening and um, we're, we're sure glad he's on our team. Thank you. Just a little side story. So I brought some Hugo's donuts over at 5:30 for the the workers over there, and all they did was give me crap because he brought Sally's or Sandy's donuts in. So so I uh, <laughs> so he opted me by one. So, Catherine, did you have any announcements? Yes, just a reminder. It's an exciting time of the year. We have graduation coming. So um, thank you to. Um, Mr. Anderson for attending the Native American celebration the other night and on behalf of the board and on June 1st we have both the adult ed and community high school graduations and on the 4th of June we start with Red River at 1 o'clock and end with GFC at 4 o'clock so we look forward to seeing many of you there. I, I also if I may and this may be inappropriate but when you talk about the referendum I also want to publicly acknowledge my boss, Dr. Brenner, I think we all know how many meetings he attended to make sure that our um, constituents were very well informed alongside Kyle Kavami, and I, I think that was a her Herculean lift, and I just want to thank him for his efforts. Let's move on to item 8B, which is board requests for future consideration. Do we have any board requests for future consideration? Could uh, could I I apologize for missing the Native American graduate celebration? Could we get could I just get a little could we get a little background on that? Um, in I don't think it has to be at a board table, but any other board requests? Okay, yeah, let's move on to eight C school board norms. Josh, how did we do? I think we did very well. Thank you. Um, so item nine is, is executive session. And before we go into executive session, I just want the public to be aware, public here, but also public uh, on, on YouTube, that when we come out of executive session in whatever time that's gonna be, the only thing we're gonna do is adjourn. So we're not gonna be conducting any more business. So YouTube will, will, will shut down because we're not gonna do anything else. So, so, and I need to start the recorder. And it's always a color coordinated, and I'm colorblind, so I always pick the wrong thing. So yeah, it's going. So, okay. The school board is going into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiating strategies for contract negotiations. Legal authority for closing this portion of the meeting is North Dakota Century Code sections 15.1, 16.22, and 44 04 19.1. At this time, I would ask for a motion to hold an executive session to discuss negotiating strategy or provide negotiating instructions for contracts which are currently being negotiated or for which negotiation is likely reasonable to occur in the immediate future. So Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Assuming a roll call vote, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Okay. Opposed, no. Thank you. We will now ask the members of the public who are attending the meeting to leave the room. We anticipate adjourning the executive session and reconvening in an open portion of the meeting 
uh, at approximately uh, 8.30.